Hello and a heartfelt welcome to our valued YouTube subscribers and those joining us for the first time. I am Prophet Shari Ann Hernandez, your host and minister, and I'm thrilled to have you with us today. Your presence truly enriches our community. If you find inspiration and encouragement in today's teaching, don't forget to show some love by hitting the like button. And for those who haven't subscribed yet, consider joining our growing family by hitting that subscribe button and ringing the notification bell. Your support what means the world to us. Thank you for being part of this uplifting journey. May your time here be filled with blessings and insights from the Word of God. Welcome and let's embark on this enriching experience together. Before we dive into the heart of our teaching, let's begin with a moment of prayer to acknowledge God's presence in our midst. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and expectation as we gather to delve into your Word and explore the profound truths it holds for us today. We acknowledge your presence among us and invite your Holy Spirit to be our guide and teacher during this time. Lord, open our hearts and minds to receive the revelation of our identity in Christ and the authority we possess as your children. May the word spoken today bring clarity and understanding to every listener and may they be empowered by the knowledge of who they are in Christ Jesus. We commit this teaching into your hands, Lord, and pray that it may bear fruit in our lives, leading us to a deeper relationship with you and a stronger faith in your promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let us open our Bibles to Ephesians 1 verses 18 to 19. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Amen. In a world filled with challenges, uncertainties, and spiritual battles, it is vital that we grasp the depth of our identity in Christ Jesus. As believers, we are not mere ordinary individuals trying to navigate life on our own. Rather, we are partakers of a divine nature indwelt by the Holy Spirit and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Amen? Now, throughout this teaching, we will uncover the scriptural foundations that affirm our position in Christ, our victory over the powers of darkness, and the authority vested in us through His name. We will journey through the Word to understand how Jesus conquered sin, death, and and the enemy on our behalf, and how we are called to live victoriously in his triumphant footsteps. Amen. So I invite you to open your hearts and minds, ready to receive the life transforming truths that will empower you to walk in the fullness of your identity as a child of God. Amen. Together, we will explore the depths of our spiritual heritage and discover the authority we possess through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As we embark on this enlightening journey, through the depths of our redemption in Christ Jesus. It's imperative to anchor ourselves in the two fundamental pillars that every believer should wholeheartedly embrace. One, our identity with Christ Jesus. This facet of our redemption unveils the profound transformation that occurs when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, illuminating our true identity as new creations in Him. And two, the authority we possess in Christ Jesus. Here we delve into the legal side of our redemption, comprehending what God accomplished for us through Christ. From the moment he bore the cross to his exalted position at the Father's right hand. While this teaching primarily focuses on the legal dimensions of our redemption, revealing the extensive work God accomplished for us through Christ, it also serves as a gateway to understanding how our redemption applies to our lives daily. Amen? Throughout the ongoing going work of the Holy Spirit, we gradually grasp the depth of our authority in Christ Jesus, empowering us to continue the mission and ministry of Jesus on the earth. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, before we explore the profound concept of identifying with Christ, let's take a brief look at the history of Adam's treason and our subsequent need for a savior to establish a foundation for today's teaching. Amen. In the beginning, God created the earth and entrusted Adam with dominion over it. 
Adam was initially the ruler of this world, enjoying a harmonious relationship with God. However, Adam's disobedience in aligning himself with Satan led to a significant shift in authority by succumbing to the temptation in the Garden of Eden. Adam effectively betrayed his position as God's representative on the earth, as most of us are familiar with the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis. Amen? This act of disobedience offered often termed as Adam's treason, had legal consequences. It resulted in a transfer of authority from Adam to Satan. Until the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, humanity was under the dominion of darkness. The Apostle Paul's writing, especially in Colossians 1 verses 12 to 13, highlight the transformation that occurs when individuals become believers in Jesus Christ. Through this transformation, believers are delivered from the power of darkness and trans translated into the kingdom of God's their son. Amen. Hallelujah. In essence, Adam's treason marked a legal transfer of authority, giving Satan dominion over the world. However, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ became the solution to the separation, offering humanity the chance to reclaim their identity in Christ and be reconciled with God. Amen. Now, understanding our identification with Christ involves a deep connection forged through the substitutional sacrifice. This profound truth highlights that as believers, we share an intimate union with Christ by virtue of him taking our place on the cross. Amen? His sacrificial act becomes our bridge to God as we are connected not only to his death, but also to his burial, resurrection, ascension, and glorification. Embracing the substitutional sacrifice is a personal journey realized by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Amen? In doing so, we enter into a transformation formative experience, living out our new identity in Christ and embracing the redemptive power that unites us with his divine purposes. Amen. From the cross to his place at the right hand of the Father, we believers were in perfect union with Christ at every stage. Even today, we remain united with him, being one with him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. As we reflect on the significance of Christ's journey to the cross, it's crucial to grasp that his sacrifice wasn't a self-serving act. He didn't endure the crucifixion as a martyr, but as a substitute for us, becoming intimately connected with our sin and suffering. In this divine exchange, we too were crucified with him on the cross of Calvary. This profound identification between Christ and humanity unveils a transformative truth. Jesus united with us in our sin so that we might become united with him in righteousness. But simply, he bore our sins to bestow upon us the gift of righteousness. Amen? When Christ was crucified, justice initiated its profound work in the background. He was condemned to justify us. To the onlookers, only the physical image of Jesus hanging on the cross was visible, concealing the profound workings behind the scenes. However, God, his angels, and even the demons could perceive the reality for they saw his spirit, the inner authentic self. In this act of redemption, justice was served and righteousness became our divine inheritance. Amen. Hallelujah. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin hallelujah galatians 2 20 i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by faith of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me while i was preparing this message the holy spirit led me to an article by billy graham entitled the beauty and the agony of the cross and i would like to read a part of that article for you i'll also leave a link in the description below where you can find the whole article amen so this is what it says think of christ's suffering for you and for me it's said that jesus endured five kinds of wounds concussion when they beat him on the head laceration when they bared his back took long leather whips with steel pellets on the end and beat him until he was bleeding from the head to the toe penetrating 
frustration when they crushed that crown of thorns on his brow. Perforation when they drove the nails through his hands and feet. And incision when they put the spear in his side. My God. Those nails through his hands and feet were driven by you and me and all the peoples of the world. We all had a part in the death of Christ because of our sins. Our sins put him on the cross and you participated. You will never understand the Bible. You will never understand the death of Christ on the cross until you understand that God is a holy and righteous and pure God. He cannot even look upon evil. In that terrible time of the agony of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, a shadow came between God the Father and God the Son. God cannot look upon sin and in that moment he was laying your sins and mine on Christ. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5 21. That means that he had never known sin, never told a lie, never had an evil thought and never had any greed or loss but all of the filth and dirt from your life and my life descended on him none of us will ever understand the mystery of that moment it was God's great love for each of us that allowed his son to take that suffering. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he had made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Isaiah 53.5-6 But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all my God while on the cross Christ not only became sin, but he became a curse. Galatians 3.13 tells us that Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hang it on a tree. Jesus took the sinner's place in judgment. He was our sin substitute. He was made sick for us. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, he endured sickness so that healing might be ours. Isaiah 53 verse Verses 3 to 4 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. My God. It wasn't the Roman soldiers or the crowd around the cross who harmed him. It was God himself. He was stricken, smitten and afflicted by God for our sins and diseases. According to Isaiah 53 10, it pleased God the Father to do this to him. Isaiah 52 14 reads, Just as many were astonished and appalled at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form marred more than the sons of men. At this point, Jesus experienced spiritual suffering as our sins and diseases were laid upon his spirit. His spirit was made sin and his spirit was made sick. God not only placed our sins upon him but also placed us upon him. The entire person our spirit, our soul and our body was involved in this sacrifice on the cross. We were nailed to the cross with him and in him our diseases became a part of him. Pay attention to this profound truth people of God. If Jesus was made sick with our sicknesses then Satan has absolutely no legal right to inflict sickness upon us. We can speak in the name of Jesus and sickness must leave. Amen? Satan has no power over us. Absolutely none. Sickness is a spiritual condition that manifests itself in our physical bodies as a disease. Now while the world perceives sickness in our bodies, God sees it in our spirit. God heals us through his word. So you see how it's important to know the word of God. Go into the word, read and study the word and allow the word of God to wash you and help you to renew your mind. It is his word that restores our sick spirits. Amen. Just as Jesus was made sin for us and both sin and us were nailed to the cross, we no longer have to be enslaved by sin. We know that by the blood of Jesus, we 
are washed clean of all of our sins. And we believe this to be true. Amen. Therefore, since Jesus was made sick with our sicknesses and diseases and dealt with them on the cross, just as he did with our sins, in the same way, we no longer have to be dominated by sicknesses and diseases. We and our sicknesses and diseases were also nailed to the cross, just like our sin. Amen. Sickness is not our portion. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are healed of all sicknesses and diseases. Satan has absolutely no right to put sicknesses on us because Jesus was already made sick for us. Amen. When Jesus died, we died with him. Jesus endured two forms of death on that fateful day at Calvary, spiritual and physical death. He experienced spiritual death prior to his physical death. In John 10, 18, it says, no man take it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. No one could take Jesus's life from him. They couldn't kill him because he was incapable of dying. Why? Jesus possessed a flawless human body similar to Adam's before sin entered the world. This body was not mortal or immortal, but it was free from sin. It could not succumb to death until sin infiltrated his spirit. In essence, Jesus had to undergo spiritual death before experiencing physical death. This emphasizes the uniqueness of his sinless human body. In Matthew 27, 46, we read, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At that moment, Jesus became like we were separated from God because of the sin that he had taken upon himself. He tasted spiritual death on behalf of all of mankind. His spirit, his inner being descended to hell in our place to pay the ultimate price that justice demanded. The physical aspect of Jesus could not remove our sins nor pay the required price. It was his spirit, his inner self that paid the price for us. He acted as our substitute and in his death we were united with him. He died under our judgment in our place. Amen. Because of his substitutional sacrifice for us, there can be no judgment against us. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus became one with Satan in spiritual death to make us one with God in spiritual life. In other words, Jesus experienced spiritual death, aligning himself with the consequences of sin in order for us to enter into the state of oneness with God in spiritual life. 2 Corinthians 5.20 one says, For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In the eyes of justice, Jesus fulfilled the requirements of justice on our behalf. When we died with Christ, we also die to sin and its dominion over us. Romans 6 7 reads, For the person who has died with Christ has been freed from the power of sin. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And for a period of three days and three nights, Jesus served as our substitute in the grave, the heart of the earth. During this time, he bore the burden of all of humanity's sins, diseases, iniquities, and pains. He remained in that place awaiting the complete satisfaction of justice's demands. While Christ's physical body lay in the tomb, his spirit man was in Hades. He was taken to the very place that should have been our abode. Can you begin to comprehend the excitement and celebration among Satan and his demons? They likely believed they had triumphed over him, that they had won the battle. Can you even attempt to envision the agony that Jesus endured during that time in Hades. It's truly unimaginable. Our minds can scarcely grasp the agony he bore for our sake in that dreadful place. My God. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the word agony as intense pain of mind or body. Anguish, torture. My God. Now throughout our years and our journey with Christ, we have undoubtedly 
undoubtedly heard and read about his crucifixion and subsequent resurrection. However, how frequently do we pause to contemplate what he suffered for us during his time in the realm of the dead? Not only what he endured on the way to the cross or even while hanging on it, but what transpired while he was in Hades. Jesus endured unimaginable trials and it's a facet of his sacrifice that deserves our deep reflection and gratitude. My God. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for paying that price for us, Lord Jesus. Where would we be without you, Jesus? Thank you, God. Thank you. Hallelujah. Let's look at the following passages from Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. My God. Acts 2, 24 to 27 reads, But God raised him up, releasing him and bringing an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in death's power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord constantly before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken from my state of security. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue exalted exceedingly. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, that is, will encamp in an Anticipation of the resurrection, for you will not forsake me and abandon my soul to Hades, the realm of the dead. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Nor let your Holy One undergo decay after death. Now, Acts 2, 29 to 32 reads, Brothers, I may confidently and freely say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, being a prophet and knowing fully that God had sworn to him with an oath that he would seat one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke prophetically of the resurrection of the Christ. Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, that he was not abandoned in death to Hades, the realm of the dead, nor did his body undergo decay. God raised this Jesus bodily from the dead, and of that fact we are all witnesses. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Apostle Paul also addresses this topic in Acts 13, 33. He said, God has completely fulfilled this promise to our children by raising up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Amen. Now to gain a profound comprehension of our identity in Christ and the authority vested in the name of Jesus, it's imperative for us to grasp the depth of our union with Jesus in his substitutional sacrifice for us. Now in the depths of Hades, within that realm of suffering, Jesus fulfilled the demands of justice on our behalf. He did so by becoming our substitute substitute, prevailing over Satan and reclaiming the keys of death, hell, and the grave. In this moment, Satan and his demonic forces witnessed our participation with Christ as we were made alive, justified, raised, and victorious alongside him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Colossians 2.15 says, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Revelations 1, 17 to 18 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. When Jesus was made alive, we were also made alive with him. Amen. In Colossians 2.13, we read, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, worldliness, manner of life, God made you alive. He quickened you together with Christ, having freely forgiven us 
all of our sins. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2 5 read, even when we were spiritually dead and separated from him because of our sins, he made us spiritually alive together with Christ. For by his grace, his undeserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. Hallelujah. Romans 6 5. For if we have become one with him, permanently united in the likeness of his death, we will also certainly be one with him and share fully in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. Acts 13 33 says, God had fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he had raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Colossians 1 18, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. As I mentioned earlier, he experienced two forms of death, spiritual death and physical death. 1 Peter 3 18, for Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus was made righteous. As I examine Colossians 2 13 and Ephesians 2 5, it becomes evident that when he was resurrected and made alive, we too were brought to life alongside him. Amen? That life that quickened him, that made him alive, was the nature of the Father. And when he received that nature, he became righteous once more. Jesus was declared righteous because he had satisfied the claims of justice. He had met every demand of the supreme court of the universe that was against us. He was made righteous with the life of God as we are made righteous in the new creation. Upon this transformation, as the father and the angels gazed upon him, they beheld him in perfect righteousness and purity, as if sin had never touched him. The instant he was made righteous marked the dawning of his reign as the supreme sovereign of the universe, the master of the underworld and the ultimate authority over Satan himself. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, when we embrace him as our Lord and Savior, we instantaneously receive eternal life and were rendered righteous at that very moment. Just like Jesus, we too can exercise dominion over the powers of hell in his name. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Hallelujah. Ephesians 4 24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The Bible tells us that Satan had the power of death, but Jesus conquered him. Jesus said in Revelations 1 18, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus obtained the keys of authority, wrenching them from the devil's grip. These keys symbolize the rightful authority vested in him. What's truly astounding is that we were present alongside Jesus during this monumental battle that unfolded folded in the depths of hell, securing a resounding victory over our adversary on our behalf. Our identity was intricately connected with him throughout this crucial event. At every step of the way, we shared in Christ's triumph. As a result, today we stand as masters over Satan. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory you secured for us over Satan. Hallelujah. Colossians 2.15 tells us, then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his 
after Jesus defeated Satan, he put him on display before three worlds, heaven, hell, and the earth. Amen. Hallelujah. When Jesus rose from the dead, we too were raised with him. Redemption is granted to us the moment we are born again, which occurs when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. There's no need to pray for it or ask for it. It is our rightful possession. At that very instant, Satan's dominion over us is terminated. We are no longer in his bondage. We are liberated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7 reads, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In accordance with Ephesians 2, 6, we were raised together with Christ. This serves as evidence of our triumph over Satan. Just as Jesus was resurrected, so were we. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2, 6 reads, And had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Similarly, we were crucified with Christ. We died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We suffered with Christ. We were justified with Christ. We were made alive with Christ. We conquered Satan with Christ. In the same way we were raised together with Christ, we were with Christ every step of the way on his journey to redemption. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, I reiterate from the moment of our reboot, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior in the eyes and the mind of God, we became victors over Satan for our victory was achieved through the triumph of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 1 reads, Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ to a new life, sharing in his resurrection from the dead, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. In conquering death, Satan and sin, Jesus achieved this on our behalf. The victory was ours, meant for our benefit. Through this triumph, we were moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Ephesians 1, 19-20 reads, I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. And then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realm and now he is exalted as first above every ruler authority government and realm of power in existence he is gloriously enthroned over every name that is ever praised, not only in this age, but in the age that is coming. And he alone is the leader and source of everything needed in the church. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus Christ and has given him the highest rank above all others. The same power that worked in Jesus' life, reanimating his once dead body, infusing it with immortality is the very power active in us at this very moment. Because we have received the life of God as new creations, we are not just conquerors. We are victors in all of life's battles. Similar to Jesus, we have been elevated above every rule, authority, power, and dominion, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Hallelujah. Like Jesus, God has put all things in subjection under our feet. God gave Christ, who is the head of the body, to be master over all the forces of the universe. In this divine arrangement, Jesus has granted us, the believers, the legal right to use his name. In fact, Jesus gave us, the believer, the power of attorney to use his name. So when we use his name, every demon and every power is compelled to obey it. Amen? Jesus is our high priest. He died as a lamb. And when he arose from the dead, he arose as our high priest. As we have read in Hebrews 9 12 it was Jesus himself who took his own blood and carried it up 
to the heavenly holy of holies and there he presented it to God. His blood was accepted and that red seal is upon the document of our redemption. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, that is the eternal witness of his finished work for us, of our legal right to eternal life and sonship with all its privileges. On the basis of that blood, we are more than conquerors. Hence, Satan holds no authority over us. His dominion is completely shattered. The emblems of this triumph are ever present before the Father. Amen? Matthew 28, 5-6 reads, But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He's not here, for he has risen, just as he said he would. Come see the place where he was lying. John 20, 15-17 reads, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? For whom are you looking? Supposing that he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you are the one who has carried him away from here, tell me where you have put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascended to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Hallelujah. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 9, 11 to 12 reads, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, that is true, spiritual worship, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not a part of this material creation. He went once for all into the holy place, the holy of holies of heaven, into the presence of God, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, having obtained and secured eternal redemption, that is, the salvation of all who personally believe in him as Savior. Hallelujah. Hebrews 7, 21 to 22 reads, For those Levites who formerly became priests received their office without its being confirmed by the taking of an oath. But this one was designated with an oath through the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind or regret it. You, Christ, are a priest forever. And so, because of the oath, greater strength and force. Jesus has become the certain guarantee of a better covenant, a more excellent and more advantageous agreement, one that will never be replaced or annulled. Amen? If you ever find yourself in a perilous situation or facing intense opposition from Satan, remind the Father of the rights secured for you through the blood of Christ. Amen? Revelations 12, 11, And they overcame and conquered him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. For they did not love their life and renounce their faith even when faced with death. We are seated with Christ. Ephesians 2 6 reveals that when we were raised with Christ, we were elevated to a position where we sit together with him in heavenly places. Ephesians 2 6 reads, and he raised us up together with him when we believed and seated us with him in the heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus, hallelujah. Matthew 28, 18 reads, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The term power, as per the Strong's Concordance, is translated from the Greek word exousia, and it signifies authority. So let us read that passage of scripture once more. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, which is the position of ultimate authority, and we, the church, are seated with him. He serves as our head, and we make up his body. It is important to observe that both the head Christ and the body, the church, were raised together. Moreover, this authority wasn't only given to the head, but also to the body. Consequently, we and Christ are inextricably linked 
In other words, we and Christ are one. The authority that belongs to Jesus Christ is also vested in each one of us, the individual members of the body of Christ. Ephesians 2, 1 and 5 to 6 reads, And you, had he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and had raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14, and verse 27. For as the body is one, and had many members, and all the members of that one body being many, a one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. Now you are the body of Christ, and the members in particular. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 6, 17 reads, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We are one with Christ. We are seated at the right hand of the majesty on high positionally that's where we are right now we are seated with christ in the place of authority in heavenly places all things have been put under our feet hallelujah for far too long we as believers have remained unaware of our genuine position in christ consequently we have unintentionally glorified the works of satan in our lives and settled for a meager existence rather than exalting our god and holding fast to our confession of hope in christ jesus it is high time that we truly grasp the significance of what god has accomplished for us through Christ. We must fully understand what it entails to be a part of the body of Christ, the elevated status to which he has elevated us, and the incredible authority we possess in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, according to Hebrews 10, 23. Amen? Hallelujah. Before I conclude my teaching, for today. I want to extend an invitation to anyone who may have been listening and has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but desires to become a part of the body of Christ. By making this decision, you can experience the elevated status to which he has raised us and access the incredible authority we possess in the name of Jesus. Amen? So repeat this prayer after me as it shows up on your screen. Heavenly Father, I humble myself as I come before you. I acknowledge that I have sinned. I repent of my sins and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he died on the cross for me and my sins. I believe that you raised him from the dead. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I receive you by faith as my personal Lord and Savior. I receive your Holy Spirit as my comforter. to help me obey you and do your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I welcome you into the family of God. Hallelujah. Now look. 15 7 says i tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent amen so know that heaven is rejoicing over you today thank you jesus glory be unto god in closing we have embarked on a profound journey of discovery today one that unveils the depth 
concept of our identity in Christ and the incredible authority that accompanies it. We have explored how through his substitutional sacrifice, we are united with Christ in his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and glorification. We have seen how Satan's dominion over us was shattered, and we have learned that our position in Christ grants us the same authority he possesses. Amen? As we conclude, remember this. You are not just a believer. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus, filled with his life, power, and authority. Satan has no legitimate hold over your life. Embrace your identity and authority in Christ and walk boldly in the victory he has secured for you. Amen? I encourage you to meditate on these truths, dive into the word of God, and continue to grow in your understanding of who you are in Christ Jesus. Let this teaching be the beginning of a journey where you walk in the fullness of your identity and authority as a child of the most high God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation and understanding we have received today about our identity in Christ Jesus and the authority we possess in his name. We praise you for the victory that Christ has won for us on the cross and for the privilege of being seated with him in heavenly places. Lord, help us to walk in the fullness of our identity to exercise the authority you have entrusted to us and to live victorious lives that bring glory to your name. We pray for every listener that they may also grasp these truths and walk in the authority and victory that is theirs through faith in Jesus Christ. May your Holy Spirit empower us to live according to our identity as victorious sons and and daughters of the Most High God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for joining us today in this insightful journey through the Word of God. Amen. If you found this teaching meaningful and wish to stay connected with our ministry, please take a moment to show your support. Give this video a thumbs up if it blessed you. Hit the subscribe button below to become a part of our growing community. And don't forget to ring that notification bell so you won't miss any future teachings and content. Your support helps us spread the message of Christ's love and authority. God bless you and may his grace and peace be with you always. Until next week, continue to walk in your identity and authority in Christ, experiencing the victorious life he has prepared for you. Amen. Goodbye.